It seems to be the season for the political rally, and it's already begun, even though it's only August. The scene you just heard described was something like a rally around Jesus, this would-be Messiah. The people were rallying around Jesus, adulating him for what he had done for them, excited, excited to see where all this was going to lead. But take note, Jesus does not play into that. When politicians hold rallies, they're working very hard, very hard to try to tell you what they think you want to hear so that you vote for them. They spend millions of dollars trying to find out what you want them to say so that you come back the next time with your vote. A political rally tends to not trade in the truth. It tends to trade in ego and giving people what they want to hear instead of perhaps what they need to hear. I've been to several political rallies over my years, and that's proved the truth every single time. Ego gets so huge when rallies are held and therefore, in that kind of a rah-rah situation, people, including the speaker, can be subject to delusions. And all of us, all of us without exception, not just at rallies, but all the time, all of us are subject to delusion. No exceptions. Ourselves, we can be deluded about who we think we are, or how important we think we are how much we matter, how much people love us. We can be deluded about our motives, thinking we're doing things for the right reason when maybe we're not. All of us are subject to delusion. And this one, who is at the center of all this attention, whoever it is, and in this gospel it's Jesus, but anytime, anywhere, can begin to think it really is about them. And make no mistake about it, this was a temptation for Jesus. From the beginning, he was tempted to make it about himself. The first temptation in the desert that set this whole thing into motion was turn the stones and the bread and you'll be wildly popular. And here he is in this scene, struggling with that exact temptation so much later in his ministry. So Jesus looks out at this crowd that showed up for him he could have let that go to his head. He could have talked himself into thinking that they really were there for him, that he is really the man. How loved he is by all these folks shouting out his name. How popular. He could have worked that crowd into a fever pitch. But this Jesus knew better than that. He's the ultimate realist. And he invites those around him to be a little more realistic about all this themselves. He didn't want to live that way. He didn't want to live as a popular human being because he was giving people what they need, what they want, instead of what they need. He could have chosen that route from the beginning, but he wouldn't let himself go there. That's not how he wanted to live. His choice was to live in a real world with real people and be as real as he can possibly be himself and invite others to live there with him. It's a hard thing to do. Apparently, it was really hard for him to keep choosing that himself. And I dare say it is for us, too. And in the process, even though people weren't really quite ready to hear it, he tells them the truth. He invites them to live in reality. And right there in the midst of reality, in the midst of this rally, really, he exposes their motives. You're not here for me. Stop shouting my name. You don't give a dang about me. You're here for yourself. You're not here for what I'm talking about. You're not here to listen to what I want to say to you. You're here for yourself and your needs and making sure your needs get met. Ouch, Jesus. 
Hello? This ain't no way to hold a rally. Not surprisingly, the crowds got thinner as he went along. They weren't in it because of who he was. They weren't in it for what he was up to in the world. They were in it because of what they wanted from him. This Jesus the Frank, I think I'm going to start calling him, Jesus the Frank tells them just that. He calls a spade a spade, as we say. He is real people. And their real intentions were exposed right there in the thick of that fervor. JC is getting his reel on. <laughs> and perhaps the good news, if there's any good news in this for us today, is that we can too. We can get a reel on if, and this is a huge if, if we really want to, if we really want to live in a real world with real people and be more real ourselves. That's a big if. Jesus is being real with himself. He was all about gathering folks for the sake of their transformation. But you see, they weren't there for their transformation. We are gathered here every Sunday morning for one reason and one reason only, for the sake of our transformation, that we leave here transformed a little more into the truth of Jesus and God. We're not here for our transformation, perhaps. They, we, they were here to meet, they were there to meet their needs, and perhaps we're here to meet our own as well. Busted. Can Jesus be this real with people? This is one of the things that I marvel as I get to know him better and better through my years. It just blows me away. How, how does he get to be so real? Can he afford to be that real with them? It's going to affect the bottom line, isn't it? It's going to affect how many people come the next time. Can we afford to be that real with each other, with ourselves? Won't it thin the crowds of our friends? Who is this Jesus who would rather have less people show up for his rallies for the right reason than have more people show up for him for the wrong reason? That's the Jesus I want to get to know and understand so I can be more like that. Who is this Jesus who would rather have less people show up for him for the right reason then have more people show up for him for the wrong reason. There's something in me that admires that Jesus exposes the illusions of the people that people live with and that fights the temptation to buy into those illusions himself. What an incredible freedom that must have been for him. And I admire that in him, that he would be willing to expose the illusions people live with and fight buying into the, those illusions himself, rather than letting people get by with those illusions. We can perhaps admire him for it, even if we find it almost impossible to live that way where we can, in relationships, be so free to call a spade a spade and then get on with it. Not hold it against them, not shame them for it, but get on with it. If you, we, if you and I dare to get a little more real, will people leave us as well? Will they walk away because we're frank and honest? Betty the Frank, Gary the Frank, Bob the Frank? Would we want to be known that way? that we're willing to expose anything in them, including their motivations and intentions, for their sake, if we trust that it's for their sake, not ours. This Jesus doesn't do a sales job on anybody. He's not into that. A couple weeks ago, I ran into a woman who had set up an appointment with me for her and her husband a little while back. I had known her for a long time, and we were friends. 
But I noticed a sort of a distance, sort of a coldness. You kind of notice it, especially in eye contact, at least I do. She was definitely averting her eyes. And so I said, I mustered a little bit of courage because it wasn't quite the situation to bring it up, perhaps. But I said, anything going on? It seems like something's happening inside of you. And she said, yeah, I'm really mad at you. I said, oh. And I started to get that anxious feeling in my tummy going, oh my god, here goes nothing. And she said, I brought my husband in and you made it all about me and my problems and you challenged me and I don't think it was fair. I said, huh. I was trying quickly to recall the conversation and I did recall it quickly because I do care about both of them very much. And I said, well, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? I said, first of all, I'm really sorry if I did a poor job of it. I really, and I mean that. I, there's probably nobody that does a poor job of these things more than I. So I'm very used to saying I'm sorry for how I delivered the message. But um, I said, did I tell you anything that was not true? And she thought for a bit. I said, and I said, you don't have to answer that. You can answer it next time we meet. And I'd love to meet with you again to talk about this. And then I said, is there anything I said that, um, how did I, what was the next question I asked? Is there anything I said that was not true? And did I challenge your husband at all on anything while we were there? And that got around to being kind of a sense of, yeah, you told me the truth, but it wasn't fair. She, she kept going back to the fair thing. And finally I said, do you trust that I care about you? And that really what I said was so that you would be freer and happier tomorrow than you are today. And she said, I trust that. I said, then I really have nothing more to say than, uh, than that I'm sorry if I delivered it poorly. And then I thought of something else. I said, by the way, at the end of that conversation, did I ask you if it felt fair between the two of you? And you said yes. And she goes, yeah, I remember that. And I go, OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> it's really hard to do this. And some of the students call me. I'm known sometimes with some of the students for dropping Gary bombs. I think I've shared that with you before, where I just, sometimes I don't have a lot of time, so I just do this Gary bomb. It's, it's what I want to say. It's what I say because I trust is loving, but I just want to say it because I may not see him again for a long time. And so I jump on it. But the truth is, it's called Gary Bomb for a reason, and that's the bad part of that is that I, I don't put a little fuzz on the end of the bomb. <laughs> you know, I drop it and then move on to the next appointment. And I, I admit that I mess that up a lot. But I'm also kind of proud that I care enough about him to tell him that. And I do. I love him to death. And, I, I don't, uh, time is short. I mean, we only have most students for four years. And I want to tell them the truth if I think it's going to set them free. Because the people who've loved me the most did that for me, even when I was mad at them back. This Jesus just continues to blow me away. The other scene that keeps coming back for me in Jesus' life is when he called his disciples to follow him. He didn't tell them. He didn't give them a snow job. He just said, I want you to follow me because dot, 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 and just to be real, it might get you killed. <laughs> the real Jesus. I do want to do a little bit of a personal witness about a tool that many of you have heard us talk about here before. I'm not selling the tool at all. I have no right to do that, but I do want to tell you how it helped me personally. And it's probably, it's called the Enneagram. I'm sure many of you have been familiar with it. This is a tool that, what's the word, chop my chops, or how do you say it? Yeah, whatever that is. <laughs> People I admire. This goes back 30 years now. People I admire because they're people who want to grow and people who are ruthlessly honest with themselves had advised me to give it a go. Unlike Myers-Briggs, which is another tool out there for growth, I think, it's not very affirming. Myers-Briggs is, but Enneagram is not. And it actually can be brutally honest. And the image I have is of a house. Our personality is a house. Well, the Enneagram takes you through the basement of your house first. It tells you what's in your basement, the mold and everything growing there, and then it takes you up to the top of the house. It exposed is our dark intentions that most of us are not even aware of. And when I realized 
through this tool, and it's just a tool, when I realized my pattern of avoidance in life because of the Enneagram, it was crushing to me. I was crushed. I had never, ever seen that dark side to my intentions before. I felt exposed, it was hard, and it saved my life. We, in the light of this gospel this morning, we just need to ask a really honest question of ourselves. Do we want to be people who want people in our lives to be real with us? Do you want me to be real with you, even if I don't do it very well sometimes? Do I want you to be real with me, even though it's going to hurt sometimes, and I'm going to want to defend myself first? It seems like most of us are comfortable with fluff. I have to say that. Fluffy relationships. I think most of us prefer fluffy even with Jesus. Who is this Jesus who would rather have less people show up for his rallies for the right reason than have more people show up for them for the wrong reason? There's something exciting to me. Let me conclude with these, this thought. I do believe the truth will set us free, even if we're not ready for it. So maybe it's better to say, well, the truth could set me free if I let it in, even if it's delivered poorly. But there's something so exciting to me about the thought that we can live together in a more real way that you and I could become more real ourselves, to ourselves, and with each other. It seems so liberating to think of living that way together, but scary too. A good marriage, a good friendship, a good community should be about people becoming more real to each other, not less. So let's get real, folks. Let's keep it as real as we can. It's just better for everybody.